Today I have a monk with me who has graduated from UCL University College of London and he has graduated in uh, information management and instead of choosing a well paid job and a comfortable life he has adopted a full time monastic life to deepen his spirituality expand his knowledge and share his timeless wisdom with the people who need it the most like us for over 20 years he's a resident monk at iskons uk headquarters which is the bhakti vedant manor he has designed numerous courses on vedic theology lifestyle management and spiritual self development and also authored 10 books which bring the ancient wisdom into the modern context in the year 2022 he has accepted vows of lifetime renunciation and these days he is a globe trotter teaching in universities corporate firms government organizations and spiritual communities bringing wisdom to the places which need it most today he happens to be in brussels and he is swayam bhagwan keshav maharaj and i'm immensely fortunate to get a chance to shoot this video with him when he happens to be in brussels Welcome Maharaj. Nice to meet you Mansi. Very happy to be here with you and all of your viewers today. So Maharaj ji, uh, could you please walk us through your early life and specifically how has your life changed since you became a sanyasi? So uh, my parents are originally from India and in the 1970s they came over to live in the UK. And I was born in 1981 so I was born in London uh, with an Indian background but very much born as a British uh, in British society I grew up in London I went to school in London and I guess when I was about 15 or 16 I began yeah being spiritually inquisitive and searching and eventually read the Bhagavad Gita at 15 and that's really what triggered my journey I found that the Bhagavad Gita was such a fascinating book which began to open up a whole new world of spirituality and opportunity and through my university years my spiritual hunger was growing and at the age of 21 when I graduated I decided um to not immediately dive into the the corporate jungle but uh instead to take some time out and I went traveling to India and that's I guess where I found my calling to to enter into monastic life and at 21 I became a monk and uh I didn't imagine it would be something I'd do for a long time uh but something I'd maybe do for a period of time uh but after spending one year as a monk I just found that it was resonating with me and i felt there was so much more to explore so i continued on and uh over 20 years later i continue to be a monk and 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 still learning and still exploring uh since last year i think when you took your vows of lifetime renunciation you became a sanyasi uh, has there been a drastic change in your life or it's still the same and it's just uh you became a sanyasi and you were already leading a life like that what's the big change yeah in vedic culture we have two types of monks or two types of renunciates one is known as a brahmachari and another is known as a sanyasi a brahmachari is a student monk and a sanyasi means a lifetime uh monk so yeah uh about a year ago i took those vows and decided that um i try to now live my whole life uh, as a monk in the renounced order as a um single celibate monk and how has life changed in many things in many ways nothing has changed in other ways everything has changed uh, it's quite uh, strange um i guess the things that haven't changed are that every day i still rise early my focus is on spiritual meditation spiritual practices it hasn't changed in the sense that for the last 20 years i've been traveling and 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 sharing wisdom in a way that's hopefully relevant for people so those activities carry on but i think the major thing that has probably changed is the scale um 
taking a lifetime renunciation opens up, opens up many more opportunities. Um, there's more responsibility. Uh, it's much more of a public life. Um, and, and, and has its own pressures, but has its own great rewards as well. Okay. So, Maharaj, with your permission, I would like to start the interview with the first question. And I think it's uh, one question that almost everyone today has. So, why relationships today with friends and family are becoming so vulnerable to damage? What are your views on that? Yeah, we live in a time which is really changing. Technology and lifestyle has really changed over the last century. Now people, in one sense, are more and more connected through devices, through the internet, through um, different communication technologies. But in another sense, we're further and further apart because the quality of those interactions is often uh, declining. And we see that this is one of the main reasons why relationships are um, suffering in this day and age because the quality face time that people had from decades ago, the time spent just at a dinner table talking or the time spent going out to the park and playing together, uh, the time spent you know, just walking from place to place and, and getting to know each other, these simple activities we're kind of missing out on nowadays. Oftentimes our lifestyle means that parents have to run out of the home uh, very, very early in the morning to earn in order to keep the household going. By the time they come back, the children are asleep and the amount of quality time that we're spending together um, is really diminishing. And so one of the most simple things in relationships is to give quality time and attention and I think in the day and age we're living in that's becoming more and more difficult and therefore we're finding that relationships are suffering. So talking about uh, a way let's say it could be a solution that's my next question according to you uh, what should be the mindset of people who are working in jobs today or handling their businesses today so that you know they can practically apply the wisdom of uh, the wise wise wisdom of Bhagavad Gita what should be their mindset Thank you so much. The Bhagavad Gita talks about something called karma yoga. Karma means action and yoga means for the divine or for a divine purpose. And so what the Gita explains actually is that when we learn to live in a spiritual way, then every single activity that we're doing is aimed towards uh, a higher goal. Every activity is meant to be a service. Every activity is meant to contribute beautifully to other people's lives, to the world. And so with our career, often what happens is that we approach our career in a kind of somewhat of a selfish way. We enter a career and we think, what will I get from it? How much money will I get from it? How much power will I get from it? How much influence will I get from it? But what the Gita says is that all of those things that you're getting are just ultimately meant to be an opportunity to give. So when we begin seeing our work as a service to the world, when we begin seeing our business as a service to the world, when we begin to see that um, uh, the activities we perform for others are so that we can have the opportunity to make their lives better, then what happens is our work, our careers, it becomes very, very exciting. Our business becomes exciting. So in the Gita, Krishna is basically saying everyone has dharma. Everyone has a purpose in this world. But dharma is never selfish. Dharma is always for the purpose of selfless service to others. And so when we learn to live our lives in a spirit of service to others, whether that be work, career, whatever we're doing, then everything becomes uh, much more satisfying and much more fulfilling. Yes. 
according to you because you are really traveling so much intensively you have uh, traveled to different geographies you're meeting so many new people every day and you're going to different segments of society as well so according to you and you're seeing also where people are happy and where they are not and i think lots of people come to you and share their problems and seek your you know guidance what according to you is the problem with the society of 2023 today what's the biggest thing that you think this is something which is really wrong with our society in the world today uh, people often talk about how we are surrounded by weapons of mass destruction but what i say is that along with that i think one of the biggest problems in the world today is weapons of mass distraction In other words, uh, we live in a society in which people's attention and ability to be present, people's uh, people don't have the headspace now to deeply contemplate and think about life. Um, and I think this is one of the biggest problems in the world today that people are so bombarded by different um, expectations, opinions, demands, and uh, different. Um, yeah barrages of information that very few people actually have the attention span and the um the sobriety to just be present and to deeply think about things and therefore in spiritual culture one of the most important things is to take some time every single day to disconnect from all the chaos of this world and really be present and really in that time of disconnection think deeply who am i uh why am i here what's my purpose what values do i want to live by um what goals should i pursue that will actually make me happy i think because people don't have that attention span and that presence and that breathing space therefore in this day and age people are not really thinking deeply and therefore they're not getting as much out of life as they could and therefore so much of our work as monks is to go out into the world and encourage people to um take that time to be more present and attentive maharaj ji next question also comes like it's very common with people and something also uh i experience so i seek your guidance here uh the definition of happiness and sadness I believe is becoming a very temporary these days. Let's say 5 years back I wanted an opportunity let's say to go abroad earn some money pay off my debts etc that I think would make me happy and after a few years it didn't make me happy anymore and let's say after that i created a new goal in life and uh, i thought maybe performing amazingly at my job would make me happy and this goal this bar changes every now and then for lot of people let for them some sometimes it's finding the right partner sometimes it's marriage sometimes it's having kids but once you reach the goal you realize i'm not happy anymore and same thing happens with sadness also so why is it really wrong to have goals set them and pursue these goals if they are not even making us happy anymore so what's wrong here thank you mansi well the question you're asking is exactly the question that arjun asked krishna at the beginning of the bhagavad gita And Krishna's first task in the Bhagavad Gita is to help Arjun redefine success. And what Krishna basically tells Arjun is he says you're looking for the right thing but you're looking for it in the wrong place. And Krishna basically explains to Arjun that there are two broad ways in which we can try to pursue happiness. One is through the realms of material gratification. and then krishna opens up to arjun that there is also happiness through spiritual um endeavors and and the spiritual path when we look for happiness in material things one of four things usually happens in scenario 1 we look for happiness in material things and we don't get it so we're frustrated Scenario number 2 we look for happiness in material things we get it but it's not the experience we thought it would be frustration 
Scenario number three, we look for happiness, we get something, it's good, but then it disappears, uh, it's temporary, frustration. And scenario number four, we get something, it's good, it lasts, but then it comes on with many other negative things that we didn't want, frustration. So what Krishna says to Arjun is that no matter what goals you set for happiness within the material realm, even when you meet them, you'll find them to not be sufficient in quenching your thirst or fulfilling your hunger of your heart. And therefore you'll have to look for something else. And like this, people go in their lives trying to create different goals. But the problem is they keep creating goals within the material realm. But they're looking for the right thing, happiness, but they're looking in the wrong place. So Krishna says, when you set spiritual goals, when you set spiritual aspirations, when you factor in um, a higher quality of happiness in your search, then you'll actually begin to find more fulfillment of the heart. And then you won't feel as though you keep looking for something else, something else, but you'll feel you've attained something much more substantial. And so this is really the message of all spiritual teachers that it's not that we shouldn't have material things and it shouldn't, it's not that we shouldn't have even material goals or ambitions, but we shouldn't invest our hopes of happiness in those things. Uh, it's not that spiritualists don't own anything, but they're not owned by those things. They don't have a sense that these are the things that will make me happy. They use it, but they real, realize happiness comes in selfless service to the divine and to other people. The position you are in right now, it's one of the most prestigious organizations in the world. And uh, they, I mean, you have immense set of responsibilities, uh, but it didn't happen in one day. You didn't develop yourself or suddenly one morning you woke up and you became like that. So definitely since childhood, you have cultivated some qualities into you, into your personality uh, that made you who you are and uh, you are contributing to this organization and in this cause of, you know, spreading spiritual wisdom. What are those qualities that helped you reach here and uh, help you pursue this journey? I'll mention, I think, three qualities that I think I try to develop in my life and, and which I continue to develop because I think these qualities are unlimitedly deep and can yield many, many fruits in someone's life. I think the first quality is discipline. Um, there's a sense in which somehow I had some of that quality in my life and, and I've tried to develop it over time. Uh, being consistent, being committed to something, doing something when even on the days when you woke up, you didn't necessarily feel like doing it. And just uh, regularly dedicating yourself to something. I think discipline and um, the ability to not give up what you want most for what feels good now um, is such a key to being successful in any field. And it's no different in the spiritual journey as well. So discipline, yeah, that hard word that we don't like um, is really, really important. One of my mentors used to say, the pain of discipline is uncomfortable, but the pain of regret is unbearable. So if we're not disciplined, then we won't reach our potential. And that is very, um, yeah, that's painful to the heart. So discipline, I think the second quality that I hold in high esteem is humility, um, being humble, being trying to be free of uh, vanity, pride, ego, arrogance. I find this quality is really, really important because it helps you to always be in a learner's mindset by which uh, every day you're learning, growing, every day you're open to receiving feedback and improving. And I think if there's not humility, then there's no opportunity for growth. In fact, the word humility comes from the word humus, which means a soil. So within a heart which is humble, you can really grow um, beautiful plants and fruits and flowers. So humility is, I think, the second quality, which is really important. And I think the third one is tolerance. Um, our teachers explain that we should be more tolerant than a tree 
If you look at trees, they go through all the seasons, they're cut, um, people pick their fruits, um, you know, trees undergo incredible amounts of uh, tribulation, but they continue giving the best of themselves, they continue growing, they continue standing tall. And so I think tolerance in a world in which there are so many, um, yeah, so many obstacles and so many uh, difficulties uh, to be tolerant and to realize that, you know, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, um, things pass like the seasons. So even when you're going through a difficult time to be tolerant and realize that brighter times will come. So, yeah, discipline, humility, and tolerance. Uh, Maharaj, you have lived uh, most of your life almost outside India, uh, but you have also spent some time in India. So you have seen about both the worlds. So I'll put some question, which we expats always have. So, but I'll put it for you in a spiritual way. So to practice your spirituality, uh, given a chance, what place would you choose? Would you go to India, given a chance, and practice your spirituality there? Or you prefer staying here uh, in Europe and traveling around and spreading your message? Yes, uh, India is the land of spiritual culture. Uh, India is uh, Bharat, which is the original name of India, means filled with light. Another name of Bharat is Bharata. Bha means Bhav, Ra means Rag and ta means tal, so it literally means the place where people express their emotions through melodies and beats and singing and music. So India really is the land of spiritual culture, the land of the saints and the sages, the avatars. And therefore, traditionally, people always journey to India to find themselves. And uh, I was no different when I was uh, 21. As I said, I went to India on that journey of course, I had gone to India before that, but this was on for a spiritual purpose. Um, India is changing, and nowadays you can go to parts of India and it feels more like London, New York, or you know, any other metro, um, metropolitan city around the world. But still in India, we do have places which very deeply imbibe spiritual culture. In India, you have places which are called dirtas. Dirta literally means a bridge. Um, and these are holy places, are bridges to eternity. For example, Vrindavan, which is Krishna's home, or, uh, you know, uh, Haridwar. You know, Haridwar literally means the doors to the land of uh, Hari. So, where would I live? Um, <laughs> well, well every, every year I spend a month in India. And uh, I spend that time in India for my spiritual rejuvenation and spiritual inspiration. So not a year goes past where I don't spend some time in India. And in that way, India gives us many gifts. Yet they say the only other place that's as holy as the theatres is the place where you can serve. And so being in London or being in America or being in Brussels um, in one sense is just as holy because here we have an opportunity to serve others. Here we have an opportunity to make a difference. Here we have an opportunity to share all of the gifts we've received with others. And therefore, uh, I think India has its gifts and traveling around the world in all of these different cities also has its own gift in our spiritual development. And therefore, as a traveling monk, I, I, I just try to get the best of all the worlds, I guess. This question is focused on the audience who has always wanted to be spiritual or been curious to explore what spirituality is. So what are the benefits of being spiritual and how can one actually start into this? So just breaking that, I mean, crossing that threshold and enter the spiritual world. Yeah, spirituality helps on so many levels. We tell people the first thing that happens when you become more spiritual is that your health improves. That means your physical health, your mental health. Nowadays, we're living in a world in which mental health is such a big problem. So spirituality improves your health. 
we tell people spirituality improves your character, you become the best version of yourself, your certain qualities that you would like to develop, your spirituality empowers that and other aspects of your character that you'd like to disappear, those start also disappearing with time. Not just that, but spirituality also helps in relationships. Um, you generally are empowered to have a deeper connection with people because you have a deeper vision and you have greater sensitivity through your spiritual practice. We also share with people that spirituality helps you to achieve your full potential because genuine, generally with spirituality you have more discipline, you have more focus, you have more clarity and presence of mind and therefore you're able to make better decisions which help you to uh, flourish. But beyond all of these things, spirituality improves your life because it gives you divine connection. Um, and this brings a certain type of fulfillment and happiness and deep satisfaction, um, which is what everyone is looking for in their, in their heart. And so spirituality, spirituality ultimately just makes you happy. Um, and how to begin developing that spirituality? Well, it's just about doing something every day where, as I mentioned, you disconnect from the world and take time for spiritual connection. So what we encourage people to do is um, spiritual meditation. So taking some time to breathe, be present and, uh, and, and just uh, be in the moment, but also mantra, you know, chanting uh, the, the sacred names of the divine which really um, elevate one's consciousness. We specifically chant the Hare Krishna mantra. So you're familiar, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, which sounds very simple, which sounds almost elementary, but is incredibly deep process. So first thing to be spiritual is spiritual meditation every day. Second thing is spiritual books. Try to spend some time immersing your intelligence and your mind in, in, in wisdom, which gives you an elevated perspective. And the third thing is spiritual people. Try to be around people who are on that journey and support and inspire and encourage each other. And through that um, good company, your spirituality will flourish. Today, the term yoga has just expanded left and right and Almost everyone in the world has their meaning of yoga. and But it's also true that not many people know the true meaning of yoga. So uh, also, uh, as Bhagavad Gita says, that uh, today, in the time we are today, uh, when we talk about the cyclical concept of time, we are in Kali Yuga. So here, uh, the surest form of reaching the eternal salvation or the best form of yoga which is recommended is bhakti yoga but uh, i'm a bit confused please guide me uh, how can just repeating and chanting name of god again and again you're just repeating it again and again how can it even lead you to salvation how does that work spiritual consciousness and divine love which is what we're ultimately trying to reawaken, <clears throat> these things are already within us. When you come to a spiritual path, it's actually not that you're learning anything new, but what's happening is that you're reawakening what's already there. And so the idea behind the mantra is that what the mantra is doing is it is cleansing the heart. If you imagine a mirror which is covered by dust, and as you begin to uh, remove that dust and you see yourself, you see the world, you see so much uh, of reality. And in the same way, when we chant the mantra, it's like removing the dust from our heart and then coming into an awareness of who we are, why we're here, who is God, what's our relationship with Him. And so the mantra, although it may seem very simplistic, what the mantra is actually doing, the vibration is it is removing layers of illusion so that we can access the innate spiritual consciousness that's already within us. So in bhakti yoga or in spirituality in general, it's not about cramming more and more information or learning newer and newer things, but it's actually just a process by which we 
um, unleash a spiritual consciousness that's already there. And that's why the, the chanting is very, very powerful. And here is my last question of the interview, but very important, I believe. And this will help us all to make uh, some right decisions in life. Because life of a person can be said as a sum of decisions. When we reflect back, we also realize what we are today is a sum of all the decisions we took. And what we will be in the future is also based on the decisions we are taking today, now and in the future. So how can an individual ensure that they take the right decisions in life? Well, Arjun at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita was faced with a decision that he had to make. And the decision was should he continue on as a warrior on the battlefield or should he move away and do something else? And in that dilemma of Arjun, Krishna basically gives him the, the key to understanding how to make good decisions. So the first thing Krishna says when you want to make a, a good decision is um, think about it, which almost sounds like that's obvious. <laughs> but it's amazing how many impulsive decisions we make without deeply thinking about the consequences of what we're about to do. So the first thing Krishna says when you want to make a good decision is contemplate. But not just that, we have to factor in uh, inspiration. Because when we contemplate a decision but it's only within our own mind or perception, then we'll only be able to make decisions um, of a certain quality. But when we factor in inspiration from other spiritual sources, from other spiritual books, then what happens is our contemplation goes to a higher level. So along with contemplation, you need inspiration from spiritual sources when making decisions. But not just that, Krishna then also says that take the guidance and advice of people who know you, love you and can help you. And so we also take assistance. Um, from, uh, from uh, trusted guides and confidants and friends. So when we take this three-step formula, we have to make a decision. So the first thing is let me think about it. But then on top of that, let me try and bring in spiritual wisdom. And then on top of that, let me also get some uh, guidance and assistance from people who love me and know me. Then when we make decisions, we'll probably be much more equipped. And I'll say one final thing on decisions, that try to make decisions which reflect your dreams more than which reflect your fears. People often make decisions because they're fearful of things, but we should rather make decisions because we have a dream and something is exciting us. Those kind of decisions are much more creative. Another thing is don't just make decisions which will please people but make decisions which will genuinely serve people. And another thing you can think of is don't just make decisions which feel good now, but make decisions which will create the most growth and which will be easy to live with for the rest of your life. And, and so, you know, if we try to follow this kind of framework, then generally we'll find we make much better decisions. Thank you, Maharaj, for answering all the questions so beautifully. And uh, this has been an immense learning for me personally. And I'm sure everyone who will watch this video will definitely learn something from it and make their life better. And they'll take take one more step forward to improvising their life. So on behalf of everyone watching this video, I would like to thank you for sharing this amazing uh, interview, answering these questions and your knowledge and wisdom with us. So we are forever indebted to you for that. And for sure, we'll watch this video not once, yeah. but again and again, so we can remind ourselves how to improvise our life. Thank you so much, Maharaj. I'm 100% sure that you thoroughly enjoyed listening to Keshav Maharaj. If you want 
to know more about him you want to learn more from him his timeless wisdom make sure you check out his youtube channel all you have to do is just search keshav swami and you'll find his channel and he has his blog also wisdom that breathes so you can check that out i'll put the links in the description of this video so make sure you complete the whole process and do check out his channel and blogs and i'll see you next time in a new video and i'm sure i hope you enjoyed watching this video and have lots of takeaways so, uh, remember to give this video a thumbs up subscribe to my channel and drop in comments how you feel and if you have any more questions i'll see you in the next video bye bye Oh, you got it, oh.